and welcome to Globe Traction. My name is Pasil Telewa. Today on the show, I sit down with Brian Afande, the founder of Black Rhino VR, a technology company based in Nairobi, Kenya, and what Brian has been able to achieve based all through the content creation and what that has been able to integrate virtual reality. I hope you enjoy Brian Afande's story. Whoa, yeah. this is amazing. Oh my gosh. This is so nice. So that's the power of the technology. It really makes you feel like you're within this space. But Dandora is amazing. It's cool. I, I, think, I think the perception I had was a little different. This is amazing. Yeah, you think so? Yeah. It's a different place to be Aww. honest. With you. It has a lot of value, I think, especially on the dump side bit of it, where yeah. you see yeah. people's trash is someone else's treasure. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a little teary. Yeah. Okay. Let's not make you cry. Do you want to try the augmented reality? Absolutely. Here you go. Augmented reality technology is the only technology that exists to date that adds a digital layer on already existing, existing. legacy yes. systems. Yeah. So for instance, you see this hat, you go to our app, you click on it. So you can see there's a book down there, but still this is like the actual brain. Yeah. Look at that. So imagine how learning will be in class. This is really stuff. nice for educational purposes indeed and, yeah because so, it gives the kids like the actual you know you don't need to go to the laboratory no you know wow. and also in the back end we have insights it can tell us how many kids were interested with the middle lobe how many kids were interested with the posterior lobe you know by clicking on it yeah so it also gives the teachers analytical information this is amazing Brian. thank you so can you just scan any image or there are particular There are images? particular images that you, you, you need to scan. This, you see, Does this. it use Wi-Fi? Yes, okay. it uses Wi-Fi. On my phone it's faster. There you go. Oh my gosh, the heart is breathing. And then it's full 3D. You can see the heart from under. Oh yeah? Yeah. Like you can really see the chambers, like you said, the... Yeah, like the, the arteries and, you know, yeah. the right ventricles. So I'm just trying to tilt the book a little bit. Yeah. See if we can get something different, perhaps. Oh. And it's, it's active, like it's a pumping heart. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just... <laughs> so, yes. So, unfortunately, we didn't create it in such a way you can be able to scale it. Yeah. But let me show you guys the brain. So the brain is massive, so we'll have to move back at some point. But what I like it, it's very detailed. Like you can be able to see the different um, uh, sections of the brain. And like you notice, this is a 30 year old book. We didn't have to reprint the book. This is how valuable this technology is. Like anything that you create, you don't have to recreate the book. You just add a digital layer to it. Yeah. This There's is so amazing. So I'm just going to tilt this again because I'm really curious. So that we can have sort of different side. Yeah. To the brain, look at that. Check that out. And the good thing about this, you can either zoom in yeah. or zoom out, like you see like, this part. Are you able to zoom into this? So now you can, you can be able to zoom in with the tablet because that's how oh, we created there you it. Go, yeah. yeah, and you can be able to also look at the top, see the different parts, mm -hmm. come back down, zoom that into is the amazing. brain. The detail is insane, right? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, this is really nice. So that's it. Um, so this is augmented reality. Those are the different use cases. This book is almost 30 years old. This is an old book. Yeah. yeah. Actually, the movie Grey's Anatomy is based on this book. Yeah. Yeah. 
Thanks for making the time today. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Over. I'm here because I know you're doing something that is really passionate to you. Yeah. Yeah, besides what you are doing previously. Yes. And I'd like to know what really inspired you to get into, you know, the VR immersive technology. Okay. So I want to be honest with you. Um, my journey is a really spiritual journey. Yeah. It started out when um, I resigned from my job. I used to be the brand manager for Converse The Shoes. For many years, I worked with a lot of people in the entertainment industry. And for me, after many years, I realized that something's got to give. And then one day, I walked inside a shopping mall on a Saturday because we had one of our stores there. And then terrorists walked in I at the see. Westgate terror attack. Yeah. And I was stuck there for six hours from 12 to around 5 p.m. Wow. And when I left, I realized that God had given me another chance to do something that was more than just me as an individual, more of a legacy. So I resigned from my job, and then I started doing research on what I could be able to do. And then one day when I was chilling with a friend of mine who is now my business partner, we were going online and Facebook had just acquired a VR company for $2.3 billion called Oculus. Yeah. And I was like, what is this VR thing? And because of my background in IT and also in entertainment, I understand technology. I started doing research and my business partner was a filmmaker at that time. And we decided to come together and start a VR company and that was it. It's God. That, that was 2015. This was in 20, when I resigned, the attack was in 2013, yeah. so in 2014 I resigned and then we did a feasibility study, a SWOT analysis on the climate of starting a business and then 2015 it was the right time for us to do it and we did it. You did it from 2015 and you've, you know, seen major collaborations yeah. like the Meta, Safaricom. Yeah. Yeah. How has that, you know, made you feel, you know, in terms of the business environment and your strategy as a company? Really good question. Um, I think me as an individual, there is when you're working with huge companies, multinational companies, and also big companies like Safaricom, first, for me as a person, it validates our thoughts and where technology is going because it's constantly evolving and it's highly dynamic. So it validates us that we are probably more or less on the right trajectory, but also it validates Africans when companies like Meta come on board and they see opportunities to collaborate with like-minded individuals who have some form of technical expertise. And they come to us because they realize that for them to execute something stellar, they need to work with individuals who are professional. So it's really also helped us amplify the work that we're doing within the continent. You know, working with organizations like Meta, they have huge, uh, numerous resources all yeah. over the world. So they also help us to amplify some of the work that we do in the continent. So I'm pretty happy to be able to work with some of these organizations. And now that you mentioned the African bit, you know, it's usually about a company just looking at, you know, its own objective. Yeah. But you're looking at the African market, I'd love to know. What is it that you're doing so differently from the rest of the VR, you know, immersive technology companies? Well, I would say something that we've been intentional from the get-go. And our ethos, our philosophy, our mission and vision is underpinned by the fact that we don't see ourselves as competition. We build competition. In fact, my friends always tell me, why are you constantly training women? Why are you constantly training artists and people? I'm like, guys, for value to circulate in an economy, you have to first create the value for it to circulate. And you have to invest in and people. And you have to invest in people. Yeah. So our mission and vision is underpinned by the fact that we see ourselves as agents of change, accelerating the adoption of immersive technology in Africa. Walk, walking in, Brian, I noticed something. Yeah. Uh, sorry to, to be specific, but I noticed a really young, you know, uh, group of, you know, Yes, employees. Work, yes yeah. and team. your workforce is really young. Yes. So how do you fish out for you know somebody who is really going to add value to the organization and not just somebody who is you know out there looking for an opportunity, for instance? Passion is everything, and that's a really good question. I want to tell you something beyond, beyond fear of contradiction. I have 17 full-time people working in the company. I have never looked at a single CV because where we are going is uncharted. What they know doesn't really matter is what they can be able to learn. There are no schools for immersive technology in Africa. So what I've been able to do, I've been able to also have very good relationships with schools. 
where I look at people with an IT background, with a design background, with a coding background, yeah. because we are called creative technologies. Yeah. And the idea behind being a creative technologies is you take the creative disciplines and you combine them with technology. And so when, let's say, for instance, Technical University of Kenya, I have a very good relationship with them, where there are stellar individuals that come out and they call me first. And they say, there's this student who's a stellar individual. I want you to talk to them and see if they can be able, because they've expressed interest to come and work for Black yeah, Rhino. Yeah. There's individuals who walked in here with dirty shoes. They walk from so far just to be part of the team. And when I sit down and I talk about them, I think the, the burden of leadership sometimes is when these people come and walk in through, they look like dwarves. But you have to pray for discernment to see the giant in the dwarf. Yeah, let, let's talk about Black Rhino VR. You know, you're self-funded, but yeah. again, just beside running, you know, the organizational, you know, ac activities, yeah. you still do training to yeah. to other people, you know, people with similar interests. Yeah. I'd love to know how has it been for you because I reckon that you've already, you know, uh, recouped. You know, your, the investment, your capital, yeah, 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 the yeah, investment yeah. capital for the, for the business, yeah. and you're now like doing so good. How, how has it been for you, to be honest? First, I'd say it's very important for you to look at your business and find out how sustainable business models can be. I mean, as a Christian, I always believe that it's important for you to also give back to the community, but at the same time also try to find pragmatic ways on how you can be able to diversify your portfolio and spread your risk. So what we intentionally did from the get-go is we realized VR is a spectrum, is one of the um, uh, subsidiaries of a spectrum called extended reality spectrum that involves virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. Under that particular spectrum, there are solutions that we were able to create, enterprise scalable solutions that we were able to create. And that's why we work with companies like Safaricom. So that Safaricom just doesn't come in for one solution. They come in for a solution that is highly scalable. And they say, can you be able to deploy another similar solution, but different audience? So from the get-go, we were very intentional about not depending on ad hoc business, but also building our own technology. And that's why I'm wearing media. It's yeah. one of our brands. It's one of our uh, technologies that we are putting out there for it to also be able to demonstrate the power of technology in Africa for Africans. So right now, a lot of the majority of the funding we get either goes to training, or goes into our expansion plan, which of course right now, looking at the East African block, yeah. we want to go venture into other markets to see how those markets are, because Kenya is a quite, has a quite a unique environment for business, and it's important for us to also spread our wings. We talk about sometimes, you know, the younger people going through the universities, but just not getting enough skills to put them out there in the job market. Yeah. But there, there is, you know, companies that are ready to nurture them and prepare them. Let's talk about this particular innovation, Brad. So the problem statement is very simple, uh -huh. that we believe it or not, we're in the fourth industrial revolution that will fundamentally change the way we work, relate to each other, the way we live. In its scope, complexity, it will fundamentally change everything. So we asked ourselves, there's a, there's a challenge that the skills that are acquired in institutions of higher learning are not the skills that are required in the market. They are not 21st century skill sets. And a lot of young people want to attain these skill sets. But then, first, they cannot afford it, or second, they don't have the opportunity to get into uh, courses that deliver certain skill sets for the future. So we decided to pivot on augmented reality, and our answer to this fundamental question was, how do we inspire a generation, creativity in Africa, but leveraging on technology? So we built media. So media is actually an acronym that combines media and augmented reality. So you see the AR at the end is any media and augmented reality. So it's the world's first platform that is a first, it's a no-code platform that allows young people to rapidly build and scale augmented reality using their mobile phone. But it's the world's first platform that has a financial inclusive model embedded into the platform where content creators and, and brands share revenue based on a pay-per-view model to deploy extended reality. So I'll show you, like, let's say, for instance, the hat that we saw. Yeah. Imagine if a young person has created that hat for, let's say, an institution. Every time it's deployed, the institution 
pays on the platform a prepaid service to demo, to showcase the AR, and the artist gets 20% of that money the institution pays. So what we are trying to do is to develop a tertiary economy of augmented reality goods, products, and services that doesn't exist in Africa. This is what we're trying to do. Um, I'm, I'm looking at augmented reality and immersive technology. Yeah. You know, from somebody who completely got no know-how. No background, no know-how. Yeah. What can you explain to them? What does that mean? Immersive technology, augmented reality. Okay, good. Yeah. So, immersive technology is really, um, um, immersive technology is an, a term that explains how you can be able to interact with technology itself or the experience itself. And immersive technologies come in different formats. For instance, when you talk about virtual reality, it's a computer-generated environment that you wear a visor over your head and you're able to interact with this environment. It's immersive because it has three things. It gives you something called agency. You feel like you can walk around. Yeah. It gives you something called presence. You feel that you're present in the moment. And the third thing is immersion. So with the immersion, it actually also tricks your mind to think that you're in an environment that you're not. And when you look at augmented reality, in essence, the word augment is English. It means to extend. Yeah. I can have digital images superimposed in the real world. I can have my phone, take out my phone, and there's an augmentation happening around. It is immersive because it's not on a linear format as opposed to a book that doesn't come to life. And when we talk about immersion, immersion is a sense of creating either a form of movement within an experience or having a sense of 3D aspects within the experience. So this is where the immersive bit comes in. It's actually about your brain tricking you that there's something more than just a linear surface. Yeah. What is it that virtual reality and augmented you know, reality. Uh, reality has been able to achieve for you? To communicate to your audience and perhaps not just your audience but even communicate brands for different you know companies yeah so first you look at something called an adoption curve yeah not all brands not all organizations or institutions have a high adoption curve to technology primarily also it could be based on their metaculture within their organizations so first things first we work with brands that have an, a high adoption rate to technology because they are looking at pivoting on the technology for different reasons. It yeah. could be for marketing campaigns, it could be to sensitize people on their message, etc. So our success has primarily been based on brands that, number one, are willing to bridge a digital divide for travel. So brands that don't want to spend a lot of money, let's say they have projects here and they want to showcase their projects in different places in the world. So what we do is we come up and package an experience that we can be able to showcase, they can be able to create a scalable solution to showcase their projects from anywhere in the world, leveraging on the technology. So let's say, for instance, one of the projects we did was with Nestle. Let me give you a, 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 a use case here. Yeah. Nestle approached us. They had a project. They had a huge seminar. They were flying people around the world to come for their seminar. But they couldn't go to Zambia. They couldn't go to Zimbabwe. Angola, South Africa, and the, 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 um, the thing was in Nairobi, right? So they sent us to those different markets to capture the essence of the market in 360. And the people in Nairobi were able to wear VR headsets and feel like they were with the Zungeiras in Angola. Yeah. And they would feel, man, I was in Angola without actually taking a Going flight. Going to Angola. Going to Angola. Yeah. The only reason why we work with Net, uh, Nestle is because their adoption curve of technology is high. So they are willing to leverage their services on technology and pay a firm for that service. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, having this small startup, yeah. you know, go so global because we're talking about, you know, National Geographic and the UNICEF and, you know, all of those, you know, big multi multinational corporations on board. Yeah. What advice would you give to, you know, startups looking to venture into, you know, this kind of field and any other field whatsoever? Yeah. First, my thing would be, if you're going to start any business, don't be only motivated by the money. You have to find your passion. Your passion really translates to something monetary. And a lot of people get into a business because they are being told in business schools there's a gap that needs to be filled, but you, maybe you're not passionate about filling that gap in yeah. the market. Yeah. So it's very important for you to realize that even in the Bible they talk about your talents are going to bring you in before kings. 
So it's very important for you to capitalize on the things as a founder of the company. Capitalize on the things that you're either talented or you have a very high skill set. So it might not be your talent, but you are trained to do something very well. Yeah. And then it's important for you to understand that when you go to the market, there's many people who offer a service. So what is your unique value proposition? A lot of the people we work with don't come to us just because we are the only XR company in the continent. They come to us because we are passionate about what we do. We don't have, our marketing budget is zero, literally zero. But we work with a lot of clients based on the fact that we go on a Zoom call and they say, you know what, I don't know about any other person. I want to, to work with these people because they are really passionate about what they do. But on the flip side, because their passion translates to service excellence in service delivery. That passion will always translate to that because you care about the message. You care about how the message is deployed. De what challenges have you faced as, you know, a company? Oof, challenges, man. Okay, first, let me start by something. Yes. There's something in Africa called technology anxiety. It's the fear of technology. Are, pe are people are scared of technology? Yes. Yeah. People are scared of the technology. By far the biggest challenge we have is not a budgetary challenge. It's not that people don't know about the technology. People don't trust the technology. And this is our biggest challenge. How do we change mindsets for them to create? The common denominator we have with our clients is value. And that value has to be based on trust as a currency. So what we've been able to do is, first, we have demystification sessions with our clients. We sit down and talk to them about what the technology is, how the technology can help them address some of the challenges they have in their organizations. And we go through a full demystification session for them to understand what AR is, mixed reality and virtual reality. We build trust. So our challenge has always been mindset. Because digital technology has what we call a colonial approach. Yeah. Because they feel digital technology has been created by the West and given to Africans. But it's not so. Africans are building their own technology. And actually, you know, they are owning it. They are owning There's it. something good about telling African stories, you know, with African companies. Yeah. And I think that's what you've been able to do. And I'm really impressed by that. Thank you. However, I'd love to know, do you have any expansion plan yeah. in place? Definitely. Um, first, maybe because of matters I can't disclose right now, yeah. uh, we are trying to look at favorable markets outside Kenya. Um, Kenya has been a very, I must say, Kenya has been a very tough environment for us. 90% um, of our clients are actually not Kenyan. 90% of our clients are um, clients that have positioning in Kenya, but are global organizations. Yeah. Um, and this is based on the fact that Kenyans also, there's the politics of getting business in Kenya. As a Christian business, we don't do the politics of getting business in Kenya. And just because of that, there's some clients, they might know that you have the particular skill sets and you can be able to deliver a certain service. But because you're not into the politics of getting that business, they'll not give you the They job. don't give you the business, which is fine by us. If it's the nuances that exist in the market, it's fine. But we know who butters our bread. And that's why we've taken very intentional decisions to also diversify our portfolio in other markets. Because the ease of doing business in those markets are favorable than Kenya. You, you, did, you did this different course in the university. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I studied epistemology and philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know why I was like, you are a trained who? <laughs> Philosopher. Yeah. And I'm like, what changed, you know, in life with your career? And then suddenly you chose this kind of path. Um, what changed is when you're given a second chance to live life, you live beyond regret, you live beyond hesitation, you live freely but fiercely, knowing that there's someone who controls your destiny. And when I survived the terrorist attack, it was a mind shift that I needed. I was always that person playing second fiddle, but I decided to own my destiny. And this is the output of believing in something so bad and understanding that my spirituality is rooted in God. What, where did you go to school to and how were you raised? Tell well, me a little bit about your family. My story is kind of a sad story. Are you sure you want this sad story? As long as you cry, I think I'm going to be fine. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, wait. Okay, okay. Uh, Do you so need I'll some tell tissue? you. Yeah, no, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. I won't yeah. cry. I won't cry. Uh -huh. My story is a bit sad. Um, I grew up in a family of um, six kids. Both my parents were, you know, my dad used to work for Kenya Power. My mom was a teacher. Both of them died in 1997. I was 16 years old. The oldest in my family was 20, and the youngest was 12. So you have, between the firstborn and secondborn of six kids, you have eight years. When my parents died, I moved from Upper Hill, and I went to Njoro Boys. My dad died when I was in Njoro. So I moved from Njoro Boys, and I had to go to Machakos Boys because my uncle was, um, my cousin was there at DC at that time. So they needed someone to give me some form of parental supervision. So I finished my Form 4 in Machakos Boys, and then one of my cousins, because I was really into IT, one of my cousins decided to pay for me through IT school for one and a half years, just for me to understand the fundamentals of coding and I, ICDL, etc. Yeah, yeah. So my family is pretty much based on the fact that a lot of us were out in the streets. I grew up in an estate called Madaraka Estate. It's a beautiful estate. Right now it's super gentrified. You can't tell it used to be a hood. But I grew up in Madaraka Estate. If my uncle wasn't coming to visit us, we were raised by five fierce women. Mama Drago, Mama Masha, Mama Motie. Five women raised us. I used to go to the shopkeeper and tell him, Pio, Mongai, mazesina do ya kuingia tao, nenda kupiga hassle. Ebu nisaidia, the guy used to give me 40 bob. 20 bob to go, 20 bob to come. And he never even asked me a single day to pay him. Wow. So we were supported by Kinyozis, the community. The community. We yeah. were raised, if you go to Madden, you talk about the Afande kids, they'll tell you, these kids were raised by the community. Because also my folks gave back a lot to that community. Today in the morning, our Bible reading today, because we read the Bible. So in the morning, we were reading about suffering and how Jesus was in the desert for 40, 40 days. And the 40 days determined the trajectory of his, um, um, of his life. Because this is when he got out of the wilderness and he conquered a lot of stuff. And his ministry was born after those 40 days. So there's grace in suffering. And in suffering, you know, there's determination, there's perseverance, there's all these things that come through suffering. So me, I tell young guys, if you're suffering, just know God knows your name. It's just a matter of time. It's a matter of time. Yeah. And those lessons in life will be solidified because it's a refinement process. And you, only, you are refined through suffering. So me, if you suffer, by the way, just know you're in the right place to catapult yourself up. So speaking about suffering, yes. I won't let you suffer any longer. That's why I brought you a little something here to keep you oh, warm. Yeah. Possible. Thank yeah. you so much. You're welcome. Anytime. Put it on. Let's see traction. How, this how is it fits. super cool. What is this? I'm curious. No idea. Oh, it's a hoodie. My God. Do you wear those? I wear hoodies in my house, to be honest. Uh-huh. Globe Traction. This is super cool. Should I wear it now? Yes, please. Oh. You're part of the family now. You guys are the best. You can't bear We should keep gifts. coming. No, no, you should. You see, the good thing about coming to a lawyer's office is yeah. you will never live without food. So there's going to be lunch here. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you're funny. Oh. Look at you. you Yo, this amazing. reminds me from back in the day when I was DJing. I used to wear hoodies and stuff. Let nights, you know, when yeah, you're Yeah, let nights when I'm on the decks. And, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yo, this is really cool. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad you like it. Oh, thank you so yeah, much. This yeah, is very kind yeah. of and you guys. And keep doing what you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. And also keep doing what you're doing. God bless the works of your hands. Thank you. And I believe there's other opportunities for us to do some pretty cool stuff. Together. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so and much. And have a lovely day. All right, cheers. Okay, bye -bye. I hope you enjoyed the show today. Many thanks for watching the show. And make sure you join us again next Saturday at 8.30 p.m. Kenyan time only on KTN News. And if you have a story you'd like to share with us, please don't hesitate. Write to us through Globetraction at standardmedia.co.ke or DM us on our social media platforms at Globetraction or at KTN News KE. You can also tap that follow button to me on my social media platforms at Pasil Telewa on Facebook, Instagram, X, TikTok and YouTube for more or behind the scenes and any other stories. But until then, I hope to catch up with you again soon, same time, same place. Bye bye for now. <laughs>